Nothing we've liked better than to splash a bit of cash. The richer we've got, the more we've all fallen in love with spending. And you know what? So have our politicians. Only now, the party's over. We're feeling the pinch, and our politicians are facing some hard choices. In this series, I'm out to get us talking about your money and how they spend it. We'll examine who gets what and why. So, do you want to give her the money? Actually, no. No. Oh, you don't want to give no. old people the money? No. I thought you just said you did want to give old them the Old working money. class people. And I'll be showing what bang you get for your buck. The cost to you, a mere five billion pounds. We'll find out who forks out the most in tax and explore the bizarre way the system actually works. They have VAT, but they don't have VAT, but that's not a biscuit, it's a cake. It's as clear as mud, isn't it? It really, really is. I'll be finding out why spending's set to keep rising. Well, there's not many people coming to you saying, here's what we can stop doing. There's an awful lot of people queuing up outside your door saying, here's what we can start doing, here's somewhere else to spend our money. And how politicians keep getting into tangles over tax. Talking about tax and politics is a bit like talking about sex and public. You know, everybody knows it's around, but you know, they don't like to talk about it. We'll be discovering why politicians keep fooling themselves that the economy will always be plain sailing. But what they, what we amateur sailors have to know, is it can all change incredibly fast. Right now, we're facing the biggest spending squeeze since the Second World War. Tonight, we find out how on earth we got here. If you've ever wondered how politicians spend your money, or why they spend it in the way they do, follow me. We'll find out. I'm on a mission to get us talking about how we spend. And where better to start than one of Britain's shopping temples, Manchester's Trafford Centre. I've got something in my briefcase, which means I've had to borrow a security guard. It's full of your money. That's right, yours. This is how much the government spends on behalf of every family each year. 20 pounds. <laughs> about 20 pounds. <laughs> 20 pounds? Well, how much do you reckon? Hi, I've got something for you here. Oh, yeah. This is for you, your money. Lovely. Yeah, how much is there? 4,000 pounds. 5,000? 10,000? 20,000. 22,000 pounds. That's yours. Oh, lovely. It's a lot of money. Oh, I know. That pays money. Yes. Oh, my God. Is that a bit tempting? Sorry. Yeah, it's nice. <laughs> Am I just making you think, mm, I like that? You spend it well? I wouldn't say so, no. <laughs> Why not? Because we don't really see very much of it. It will definitely help in my life. Actually, you know what? It would. It's all fake, I'm afraid. Well, I still take it. <laughs> you see, while we all hear a lot about cuts, we don't have a clear idea about what the government actually spends on us. So let's start with that £22,000 I've been hawking around. Where does it all go? Add all those £22,000 up together and you get a pretty eye-watering amount. £692 billion. Pounds. Now there are seven big budgets which make up more than three quarters of all government spending. Let's have a look at them. There's transport, law and order, defence and at the moment, bigger than them all, debt interest. But the three really big ones are these. Education. That's about £2,800 per family. In total, over £90 billion. Health. That's about £3,800 per family. Or in total, about £121 billion. And then Social Security, the whopper. £194 billion. For every family, that's just over £6,000. 
That, of course, isn't just benefits for the unemployed or the disabled, but the big pension bill as well. Now, let's ignore the deficit for a moment. The big problem facing politicians long term is that those big bills just keep rising. This is Spitalfields Market in London, where once a month, pensioners gather for a tea dance. Many here are over 80, glorious proof that we're living longer, often healthier lives, but ones, let's face it, with higher bills attached. First things first, though, could I make it onto Strictly? I have the clue where I'm going. You're very good at leading. In 1901, there were just 60,000 people aged 85 or over. You can't, you just know it in your head. Now, there are one and a half million, 25 times as many. And that figure is set to double in the next 20 years. There'll be three million over 85 year olds. Am I learning? What we're all learning is just how expensive that will be. Getting there, you get I can now feel the rhythm. I'm not sure what I'm doing with my... Oh, you're all right. Sorry, my fault. In 50 years' time, we're forecast to be spending £80 billion more each year just to cope with our ageing population. That's more than double the defence budget. If you had to hold up one of those things like they do on Strictly, dancing. my dancing. You can't dance. No. Oh, don't say no, that. You can't. No. <laughs> I didn't tread on your toes too often. No, you didn't tread on my toes at all. Oh. You have perfect chin. Thank you very much. There were so many people living to a good age. Do you ever think, where's the money going to come from to pay for all of it? No, I don't worry about that because no, I'll be think, six foot no, under by then. It's <laughs> my problem, you mean? No, I think our well, children my... have that worry, not us. It's going to get a bit more pricey, isn't it, with so many people living older? Yes, it certainly is. But I'm not that anxious to go anywhere yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hang on as long as possible and I hope everybody else does. Mind you, We've worked a lot of years, and we've paid in a lot of years. Yeah. All of us. Even if you dance as badly as I do, you leave the tea dance at Spitalfields feeling pretty good. It's a celebration of growing older, instead of people moping about it. And yet, as politicians try to keep in step with our ever-aging population, they find themselves getting into a tangle too. You see, politicians find it very hard to cut back on spending on the elderly. So let me tell you a story. It's about winter fuel allowance, a new benefit introduced by Labour in 1997 at a cost of £268 million in today's money. The winter fuel allowance, when it was introduced, was intended as just a little bit of extra help, £20 a year, for every pensioner, regardless of how well off they were. But that was soon to change, when Gordon Brown was accused of being a miser, when he introduced an increase in the weekly pension of just 75 pence. The fury that that produced confirmed what every politician knows. There is nothing so terrifying as a pensioner who feels wrong. Tony Blair even dubbed them like Rottweilers on speed. Britain's pensioners went into battle over the 75p rise. Oh, it was an insult, wasn't it? Absolute insult to us, all of us. Nora Knight was so angry about this year's 75p pension rise that she sent it back in the form of a cheque to Gordon Brown. Then, to add insult to injury, she was astounded to find the Treasury had cashed her cheque. And when pensioners start hijacking buses, you know you're in trouble. The then Chancellor, Gordon Brown, decided to throw money at the problem. And winter fuel allowance went up. The winter allowance is currently paid to all 8 million elderly households at £20. 
I've decided to raise it to £100. And up? It will be paid not at £150, but at £200 for every... for every pensioner household. And up? For this year, for those over 70, on top of the winter fuel payment, we will pay an additional £100 to each household. So, by 2004, the cost had risen to... £2.3 billion, eight times more than it originally cost. With fuel bills rising, you might say, why not? But can we really afford to keep giving it to everyone, no matter how rich they are? I've got 200 quid here, okay. right, and uh, I want to know, is it a good idea that the government gives £200 to old people for winter fuel allowance? Is that a good idea? Old people, they should be really prioritised because they don't work yeah. and pension is uh, not really a good rate, so... So give them this money? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so do you want to give her the money? Actually, no, no. Oh, you don't want to give no. old people the money? No. I thought you just said you did want to give old them the Old working money. class people. How about him? Definitely not. No, don't give him the money, him? No way. Well, These people are, like, very... You know, wealthy. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Definitely a good yeah. idea. Okay. Yes. So, um, should knowledge. he get the two hundred pounds? Well, I suppose it has to be means tested. I suppose. Oh, what, what about her? No. Or, or him? I think they're quite well off. <laughs> oh, so they shouldn't get the two hundred pounds. Um, no, I suppose you pay like that. No. So we like the idea of spending on the elderly, but we're not so sure about handouts to those who don't need them. And some wealthy pensioners agree, like nightclub empresario Peter Stringfellow, a man so outraged at getting the money, he went to the trouble of trying to send it back. She's the big lady herself. So, Peter, you're 70. 71st year. Uh, not short of a bob or two? No. More than one house? Two. More than one nightclub? Three. Pay yourself enough to earn top-rate tax? Uh, not too short of half a million a year. Half a million pounds a year. So how important is getting £200 a year from the government for it to you? It's embarrassing to me. I don't ask for it. I don't expect it. It was not something that I knew was going to come along. You wanted the government to give you the chance to say no. Yes, I did. And then eventually I got a letter back from them saying you will not be receiving it in future. <laughs> <laughs> However, if you change your mind, please let us know and then we'll reinstate it. That's not what I wanted. I wanted them to change the whole policy of not giving it to people who don't need it. I think the problem with winter fuel allowance, it's indiscriminate. It's not targeted. Uh, it's not means tested. So you're actually giving um, you know, a reasonably significant amount of money overall to people who didn't need it. Why did it happen then? It happened because we have a great sympathy uh, for the elderly. We wanted and have a pledge to create dignity uh, for people in their uh, old age. You were in a hole as a government, were you? would increase the pension by well, 70 we, we had also uh, shot ourselves in the foot uh, uh, one year by giving a very modest uh, increase in, in, in the state pension, and there was uh, inevitably a great sort of backlash uh, against that. So there was a, there was a bit of politics uh, in this. A bit of politics which comes at a very high price and doesn't target money on those who need it most. Even those who work closely with Gordon Brown at number 10 think it's not the best way to spend our money. If you go and ask Treasury officials, they would love to take away winter fuel allowance. It would be the first thing on their list. So why hasn't it been cut? Politics. Because you know, older people vote more than younger people, they mobilise themselves, they want to defend uh, their benefits. And you know, it's very, very hard in those circumstances to confront them with the loss of a benefit. And so whatever the mandarins say, whatever the number crunchers say, whatever policy wonks say, it comes down to a political judgment. I want you to do everything you can to get him elected. In the dying hours of last year's general election campaign, David Cameron had to make exactly that judgment. Labour's election supremos were targeting him, claiming he'd axe benefits for the elderly. The question was, how would he react? What are you going to get? David Cameron's whole strategy in changing the face of the Conservative Party was to say we're caring. So it's very difficult.